one of the common denominators or common factors in all of these outbreaks is that every time a facility began sterilizing all of their scopes with ethylene oxide, the outbreak ended. Ethylene oxide is the only technology that was consistently able to end the outbreak in facility after facility. And there are a number of papers being written right now documenting this. The 2015 experience was, um, was a real eye-opener. And you may recall that in the midst of this, uh, FDA released a special guidance of four supplemental measures for the reprocessing of uh, duodenoscopes and other critical instruments. And the only uh, sterilant that they mentioned by name was ethylene oxide. Millions of patients undergo surgical procedures every single day. Working behind the scenes are the technicians who go largely unknown, even to the patients whose lives are so dramatically impacted by their work. This is Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Join us as we explore this hidden world and introduce you to the unsung heroes driving the advancement of our profession. And now, your hosts, Hank Balch, Justin Poulin, and Michael Matthews. Beyond Clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Ted May, President and CEO at Anderson Products. Ted is an experienced manager of medical device manufacturing business and medical device startup companies. He has a proven track record in general management, sales, marketing, and distribution with regulatory affairs experience in medical devices, both in the creation of national standards such as AMI and implementation at the corporate level, FDA and ISO quality systems. Ted has a hands-on international experience in all aspects of the import Import and export business, new market entry strategies, and international distribution. Ted has represented U.S. manufacturers in Europe, Asia, and Latin America in commercial and regulatory negotiations, trade shows, and business missions. He has a strong knowledge of U.S. federal trade, business promotion, and regulatory programs. And we're really going to get into it today in terms of regulation around ethylene oxide. Really excited to talk with Ted today, Mike. Yeah, this is going to be really interesting and a big learning opportunity for people, particularly like myself, uh, who didn't really know anything about ethylene oxide other than what you read about in you know your CRCST manual, which basically just says, you know, hey, ethylene oxide is this old technology and you know it's extremely dangerous. Thankfully, most hospitals are moving away from it. And, you know, that's that's our only concept of the chemical. Uh, and so, learning about it and its potential future applications uh, is something that's going to be uh, really eye opening. And I'm looking forward to it. Beyond clean. Joining us now on Beyond Clean is Ted May, President and CEO at Anderson Products. And Ted, I don't think originally we were planning on having you on in Season 4. I think we were looking at Season 5. But due to recent events that are very public in nature and impacting the industry today, we really wanted to have you come on the show and share your knowledge around ethylene oxide with our listeners today. So thank you for coming on. No, guys, thank you very much. Um, ethylene oxide seems to uh, keep popping back into the news, so there's a lot going on right now. Yeah, there really is, and it was one of those things that I think, especially for frontline technicians, we really saw it going away and going away and, and much more limited use, but on the manufacturing side, it was still very prevalent in the industry, and I think maybe we can go to the beginning and maybe give us a background on ethylene oxide, a history of its use and, and development in the industry. Yeah, this is a great story. I, I love the backstory on stuff like this, and ethylene oxide has a very interesting one. It was discovered right before the American Civil War um, in Europe by a French chemist and was used originally uh, in a commercial fashion to sterilize spices. And this application began in the, the 1920s, and I believe the patent in the U.S. took place in the 30s. But the ethylene oxide story gets really interesting between World War I and World War II. Uh, everyone is aware that in World War I, you had the, the terrible use of chemical weapons for the first time. And as World War II drew closer, 
military strategists thought that it was going to be the same thing, only worse. And the Allies knew that the Germans at the time had the most advanced chemical industry in the world. And so the Allies began focusing on um, another terrible weapon, which are, are bioweapons. And it's not well known, but the British and American forces had huge stockpiles of anthrax bombs that we were ready to use if the Germans began using their terrible new gas weapons. And the American lab that was doing a lot of this work was in Fort Detrick, Maryland. And if you are playing around with bioweapons, you've got a problem because you, you need a way of cleaning them up. And ethylene oxide becomes the hero of this early story in that uh, a number of the early researchers realized that ethylene oxide was a great way of neutralizing the bioweapons they were creating. And there was a famous researcher uh, by the name of Charles Phillips who uh, threw a tarp over a, a three-quarter ton truck, pumped ethylene oxide under the tarp, and then announced, I know how to sterilize a truck if anybody needs a sterile truck. And you, you hear variations on that story. Some people say it was a tank, but that was where ethylene oxide really came to the attention of some important researchers. And after World War II, these very same researchers, uh, Charles Phillips and Saul Kay, uh, realized that this technology had interesting applications for the human healthcare market. And after World War II, there was a major development in medical devices that called for a new technology. And that development was the introduction of plastics. And prior to World War II, if you wanted to sterilize something, all the instruments were metal. So, you know, cooking them in an autoclave was very effective. And so uh, ethylene oxide really came into use because medical devices themselves had changed. This takes us into the 50s, and the first hospital-based systems were introduced really late 50s, and these were based on autoclaves. They were big metal chambers, and they were run off of large 50-pound tanks. There weren't much in the way of controls. Uh, there weren't much in the way of operator protections. And as many people know, ethylene oxide is not only flammable, it's highly explosive. And going into the 60s, there were some very high-profile cases where these 50-pound tanks of ethylene oxide leaked. They uh, encountered an ignition source, and a 50-pound tank of ethylene oxide going up causes some real problems. And, you know, this is the start of the, the bad reputation that ethylene oxide got, that, you know, oh, my goodness, these 50-pound these tanks are potential bombs. I'll tell you, Ted, the, the history of VTO in the sterile processing setting as you're getting into, it does go back a couple of decades. And, and for those of us on the younger side in the industry, I started in sterile processing in, in the mid-2000s. And so I hear stories from my previous managers and directors about exactly what you're talking about. But obviously, I wasn't even born in the 70s, so... Uh, the accidents maybe that it had happened and that even made it to the news, those weren't things that I lived through and definitely not anything that I saw as a sterile processing professional. So what came out of, of the challenges then in the 60s rolling into the 70s? Well, you know, you, you make a really good point, and that is that the people that were using these early systems are the people who are running departments now. And so a lot of the, the thought leaders are the people who had, you know, experiences with these early systems. And ethylene oxide has been a, a technology that has developed steadily. And these early systems were problematic. And so a number of companies came up with ways of reducing the potential risk of these systems. And specifically, they began cutting or mixing the ethylene oxide with an inert gas. Some people have heard of these. They were called uh, 8812 systems or 8911 systems. And the idea was to mix ethylene oxide with enough of an inert gas that it was no longer flammable. And by the late 60s and 70s, these mixture systems began to replace the 100% ethylene oxide systems. Obviously, they were, they were popular because you didn't have this, this risk of explosion. Uh, you had to use a bit more gas because they did not have the same lethality as 100% ethylene oxide. This is what was used really through the, the 70s 
At this point in the 70s, something else happens for our story, and that is that in 1971, um, OSHA is created, the Occupational Health and Safety Association, and OSHA began looking at chemicals in the workplace. And in the hospital workplace, one of the first chemicals they began looking at was ethylene oxide. And as I said, a lot of these early systems did not have much in the way of controls, and so OSHA quite properly began looking at the, the danger of potential exposure. And starting in the late 70s, they set operator exposure standards at, I think it was first it was 50 parts per million, and then by the 80s it had dropped down to, uh, to one part per million, where it exists today. Through the 80s, this was the standard. In the 80s, you had the development of some of the cartridge-based systems. Many people have used the, uh, the systems that were introduced by 3M and later AMSCO that use 170-gram uh, cartridges and 100-gram cartridges. And these were a big improvement over the tank systems, but they were still using a significant amount of gas. And it was in the 80s that you had companies begin to develop uh, alternatives to ethylene oxide. And these were, at the time, not terribly successful. It took another development to really change that. And this development was the, the Montreal Protocol on greenhouse gases, specifically substances that deplete the ozone layer. A lot of the old timers Listeners to your show will remember that back in the day, you could go to an auto parts store and buy a, a can of Freon and put it in your own uh, AC unit in your car, and that ended with the Montreal Protocol. Now, it just so happens that the inert gas that was being used in these ethylene oxide mixture systems was a chlorofluorocarbon, a CFC, and these were exactly what was targeted by the Montreal Protocol. And so... That international treaty was signed in 1987. It came into force in 1991. And between 91 and 96, it phased out the use of CFCs. And it was exactly at that time that uh, Johnson & Johnson, their advanced sterilization products subsidiary, introduced the Sterad, and Steris uh, began pushing the Steris System 1. And if you go back and you look at the marketing of these early systems, the steroid being hydrogen peroxide and the steroid system one being parasitic acid, a lot of their mo marketing focused on the fact that we are not ethylene oxide. And they played up the dangers of ethylene oxide quite dramatically. And as hospitals were forced to either get rid of their mixture systems using the CFCs uh, or upgrade them, and there was a an extended phase out for ethylene oxide system, systems using hydrochlorofluorocarbons or HCFCs. A lot of hospitals began to uh, go to these new technologies, and the marketing by these competitors of we are not ethylene oxide, and oh, let's remind you of all the dangers of these early ethylene oxide systems uh, was very effective. And that's where you, you start to see a real turning point in the use of ethylene oxide in hospitals. Yeah, Ted, and that's about probably, uh, you know, the time that some of the younger guys like myself and Hank were, you know, starting to come into the industry was this phase out of the ethylene oxide. And everybody, they didn't really, we don't really know much about ethylene oxide. We just know it's super duper dangerous. And so that was kind of the effectiveness of the marketing that had come through. You know, we just didn't know anything about it. So a lot of times people would ask like, well, what was so great about ethylene oxide uh, you know, that we were using it in the first place. And one thing that I didn't know uh, was that ETO actually played a really important role in ending the 2015 CRE outbreak that made such uh, big news. And of course, this becomes even more relevant today as uh, just a few minutes ago, I read a LinkedIn post from a good friend of the show, Sean Flynn, uh, where the FDA had announced that they have assigned uh, I believe it was three more deaths and 46 more infections uh, as continuing on in related to uh, tainted uh, duodenoscopes. So would you mind just telling us a little bit how ETO played a role in that 2015 CRE outbreak, particularly ending it? Yeah, I, I'd love to back up a little bit because, again, I, I, I love the, 
the, the backstory on these things. And the CRE outbreak of 2015 was uh, unique and different for a number of reasons. Specifically, when an outbreak like this happens, uh, CDC and other researchers come in and try and figure out what happened. And historically, if someone contracts an infection in a hospital and dies, you don't know where the infection came from. You know, there are all sorts of opportunities in a hospital to, to come in contact with an organism. One of the unique things in 2015 is that for the first time, one of the first times, they began using uh, DNA analysis to identify the specific microorganism that had killed a patient. And then by swabbing uh, different instruments, different areas of the hospital, they were able to conclusively link an instrument that had recoverable organisms with the organism that killed the patient. And this is huge because, among other things, it provided attorneys with the ammunition they needed to, to launch lawsuits. The other thing that was interesting about this is that when the CDC and other researchers went in and they looked at the equipment that was being used, they looked at the protocols that were being followed, the training logs, it appeared that everything was being done right. The equipment worked, the people were following the protocols, and the bugs were surviving. What was being used in all of these different facilities, and again, this was the outbreak took place uh, across the country. This is not a case of one or two inc uh, incidences. This was, as I recall, it was seven or eight different facilities uh, on the East Coast, West Coast, and in between. And again, the, the standard of care uh, was not working. The bugs were surviving. And one of the common denominators or common factors in all of these outbreaks is that Every time a facility began sterilizing all of their scopes with ethylene oxide, the outbreak ended. And ethylene oxide is the only technology that was consistently able to end the outbreak in facility after facility. And there are a number of papers being written right now documenting this. The 2015 experience was, um, was a real eye-opener. And you may recall that in the midst of this, uh, FDA released a special guidance of four supplemental measures for the reprocessing of uh, duodenoscopes and other critical instruments, and the only uh, sterilant that they mentioned by name was ethylene oxide. It's interesting if you look at that, you know, 2015 is not that long ago. We're still in the early stages of 2019, and to think that if the outbreak is in our recent history, the results of the reintroduction, if you will, of ETO to that process had that effect. And yet, if you look around the country today, have we really changed the same processes that led to the outbreak? And as Mike said, you know, there, there's still a lot of question in regards to that. And I think there's a lot of news stories coming out that say maybe we have not changed enough. I know we skipped over it, you know, historically, we went from the the 80s and 90s all the way to 2015, but a lot happened in that time, and, and in particular, in the growth of ETO technology. I was wondering if you could speak to that, maybe uh, the window between the 90s and 2015, what was going on then, and what has been going on, you know, since 2015? Well, I think most of your audience uh, knows you know, what was going on, and that was an increased emphasis upon cycle time, cycle time, cycle time. The competitive technologies to ethylene oxide sold their, their processes on the basis that, number one, they were not ethylene oxide, and number two, the cycle was much faster. And so going into the 2000s, the shift in processing really focused to, to how quickly you could do it. You know, there's no denying that the hydrogen peroxide systems, the parasitic acid systems are a lot faster. Ethylene oxide uh, was dying a slow death at that point. The, again, the, the, the CFC-based systems were phased out in the 90s. The systems using the HCFCs were phased out starting in 2010. They, they were completely phased out in 2015. And most hospitals at that point had uh, gotten rid of ethylene oxide, and a lot of them were quite proud of that. So one of the, the paradoxes of the FDA's supplemental guidance 
was that they, they recommended the use of ethylene oxide at a time when most hospitals did not have that available to them. As we've discussed, ethylene oxide has not been a static, a static technology. It's developed consistently since it was introduced in the 50s. And today there's a, there's a whole new wave of ethylene oxide sterilizers available that instead of using big 50 pound tanks are using grams of ethylene oxide, very small 17 gram cartridges that are just orders of magnitude more efficient than what existed before. And where an ethylene oxide sterilizer historically was built into a wall and you had external compressors and fixed water lines and there was typically a service room behind the, the sterilizers, uh, modern ethylene oxide sterilizers are small tabletop systems that are you know, easy to install. They're very space efficient. And it's a, a very different technology from what the people using you know, the ethylene oxide sterilizers of the 80s and 90s remember. So, Ted, um, I've got two more things that I want to make sure we cover before the end of the interview. And one of them is the fact that we had David Hilliker several months ago back on an episode, and we were talking about exposure. And I know that obviously was a big concern with ETO, but he raised a concern, you know, for hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid and other low temp sterilization methods as well. And I think the biggest thing that he talked about and emphasized was just getting a handle on it in terms of regulatory. So uh, OSHA apparently is getting around to establishing some exposure standards for these other chemical sterilants and disinfectants. And I thought, you know, maybe you could outline some of the regulations that's coming down the pike. And then I do want to talk about the big topic that's impacting the industry today related to ETO following that. So maybe give us just a little bit of the, the OSHA and other regulatory information for our listeners too. Sure. It's, uh, it's interesting how things run in cycles. And as we said, ethylene oxide was introduced in the 50s. It really wasn't until the late 70s and 80s that OSHA got around to regulating ethylene oxide. It took about 25, 30 years. For the technologies that we've discussed, the competitive technologies that were introduced in the early 90s, well, guess what? It's been 25, 30 years since they were introduced. In most cases, they've become the standard of care. And in fact, OSHA, NIOSH are starting to look uh, ever more closely at these ethylene oxide alternatives. And as many people have pointed out, the operator exposure standards that they've come up with are the same as for ethylene oxide, or in many cases, they are stricter than they are for ethylene oxide. And one of the things that I think troubles a lot of people uh, in the infection control industry is that ethylene oxide is, it's the chemical we know. And everyone knows that if you're using ethylene oxide, you have to test for it, you have to um, do personnel monitoring, you should be doing area monitoring. Very, very few facilities are monitoring for hydrogen peroxide, and I don't know of any right now that are monitoring for parasitic acid. Again, for these two chemicals, depending upon what standard you're using, the operator exposure uh, levels are the same as for ethylene oxide or stricter. And most people are not testing for these chemicals. Ted, and I just got to throw in, referencing back there to, to Hilliker's episode, for those of us who, like I said, are newer in the industry, you know, that is almost the exact opposite of what we were essentially told to believe. We were told that ethylene oxide was this super dangerous chemical, uh, and it was archaic, and no one ever wanted to be around it. And yet, 20 years now after the introduction of hydrogen peroxide, uh, we still don't actually know how dangerous it is, and yet we're just assuming and acting as though it is safer when the truth is the research just really hasn't even been done, so it's not even necessarily an even playing field between the two technologies. OSHA and NIOSH have a standard called the IDLH, which is the immediate danger to life and health. That's the exposure level at which a chemical can permanently harm you, cause serious damage, potentially kill you. The IDLH is uh, a number where you want it to be as high as possible. You want you know, it to be exposed to... Um, 
you know, small amounts are not going to hurt you. And the IDLH for ethylene oxide is 800 parts per million. For hydrogen peroxide, it's 75 parts per million. The IDLH for hydrogen peroxide is a full order of magnitude lower than it is for ethylene oxide. And that, that tells you something about how these regulatory bodies regard the two chemicals. Excellent, Ted. Great explanation there. And I also have to just let our listeners know, I'm sure everybody's familiar with OSHA, but we always like to tell everybody what the acronyms stand for. That's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And then you also mentioned NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And obviously, if you're a frontline technician listening to this episode and you're worried about exposure and occupational safety, Uh, Obviously, these two governing bodies very much relating to your work environment. So, Ted, also we have this global leader in sterilization, and it looks like, uh, and I know they've used more than just ethylene oxide. They've done some gamma, gamma ray radiation as well, but they're going to end up closing shop, I guess, and there's going to be an impact. Um, And again, more on the manufacturer side, maybe the single-use items that get delivered to hospitals, uh, consumables, but there's going to be a big impact on the industry potentially, and the FDA recently released you know, some statements around that and was picked up by Infection Control today, and I read it, which is actually what led us to reach out to you and have you come on to an earlier season, but I wanted to get your thoughts on how this is going to impact the industry. And I know you're working with the FDA, so maybe you have some insight on, you know, just how this can be addressed successfully. Sure. And it's, it's a tough situation. Uh, right now, about 60% of all new medical devices are sterilized with ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide has become less common in human hospitals But on the industrial side, it is still how most new devices are sterilized. And the state of the art is what's known as a pallet chamber. And they are called pallet chambers because they are measured by the number of of shipping pallets that you can fit into them. These chambers are huge. They're, They're loaded with forklifts. And the state of the art right now are chambers that can accommodate more than 50 pallets. I mean, they're just immense. And if you're a a major medical device manufacturer and you're sterilizing bandages in the the tens of millions or needles in the tens of millions, uh, this is a very, very efficient way of sterilizing large quantities of product. The reason that people use these systems is that they're very cost effective and there's still a great many products that can't be sterilized effectively any other way. And so I think the The situation that you're describing in Illinois uh, has been linked to a number of facilities that are coming under very close scrutiny. I think there's going to be broader scrutiny of these uh, contract sterilization facilities across the country. Personally, I think they're going to uh, get this situation figured out in the sense of improving the, the scrubbers, improving their protocols. Uh, Right now, there is no alternative to these immense 50 pallet chambers. I think the the scrutiny is going to cause the industry to tighten up. Uh, It will cause, you know, some medical device manufacturers to look at other technologies. But right now, there there is no good alternative to uh, to ethylene oxide when it comes to sterilizing really large quantities of devices in a cost-effective fashion. Well, Ted, I also know, and won't necessarily be a discussion for today's episode, but I know you're doing some innovative things at Anderson Products around ETO and really reducing the amount that's being used uh, when sterilizing some of those products. So I have no doubts after listening to this episode today and your insights that you'll be a big leader in helping solve that challenge. So I just wanted to thank you for coming on, especially at last minute's notice and being able to talk a lot about this topic because uh, it really has risen in uh, profile, I guess, over the last month or several weeks. And it's nice of you to be able to join us and give our listeners a a real in-depth kind of look, uh, not only in depth in terms of the ETO and the competitive marketplace, but also just the history of its use was uh, extremely valuable. So thank you for coming on the show. Well, no, thank you guys. And uh, let me compliment you on 
uh, really bringing attention to a, a very important part of the healthcare industry, you know, infection control. I think that as superbugs become more and more formidable, and they're going to be more in the news, and you're really helping to bring a lot of awareness to what I think is a, a critical part of you know, the healthcare industry. So thank you. That was Ted May, president and CEO at Anderson Products. Hank, this definitely tied in with our David Hilliker episode, and I think it was great that we were able to give so much information to our listeners, especially because, as we mentioned several times throughout the interview, this topic really came to the forefront again over the last month or so. That's right, Justin. And as Mike mentioned earlier in the episode, a lot of us grew up in sterile processing, in departments, at the ETO was long gone. And all we heard were shadows and rumors about the technology and the, and the impact of it and even the dangers of it. So I've been interested just to learn more because if you look at the application, especially when we look at that 2015 outbreak, it's so interesting to see that ETO works. And if it works, the question for all the rest of us has always been, why did we get it out and why is it never coming back in or, or why is that the perspective on it? So I learned a ton on this episode and I know a lot of folks in our generation will as well. Yeah, and I also liked hearing the history, just going back to its initial applications and how it found its way into healthcare. Seems like we've known a lot about this chemical for a very long time. But that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Simply search for Beyond Clean Podcast. We'd appreciate a rating and a review. Your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.